Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. I am excited to talk some chess improvement and life with our guest. But first, as always, wanted to give a shout out to our presenting chess education sponsors, Chessable.com. Our guest has an excellent Chessable course, which we will be discussing. But they've also got a bunch of new stuff that you guys could check for from some of their heavy hitter famed authors, including friends of the pod like Grandmaster Ben Feingold, I am Christoph Zalecki, uh, Camille Plichta, renowned opening theoretician who Hikaru mistook for a grandmaster because his work was so good. So be sure to go to chessable.com and check out what they have to offer. Also, if you lo- use the link in the show description uh, to sign up for Chessable Pro, it helps support Perpetual Chess, even if you're already a pro member. Um, it helps support if you click through and then buy something. And of course, if you are a pro member, you get discounts on courses and can use Puzzle Connect to connect to your chess.com course, I mean, uh, account and stuff like that. Um, But we're going to be discussing Chessable more in due time because, again, our guest has a great Chessable course called Developing Chess Intuition, Domination, and Other Lesser Known Positional Concepts. He is an NYC-bred, Paraguay-based grandmaster who... Uh, among other accomplishments, shared first in the 2019 Citrus International. He was the national high school champion. Um, to become a grandmaster, he was largely self-taught, and his expertise includes blindfold chess and game technique, and he's good on calculation and visualization as well. And I'm excited to discuss all that stuff with our guest, uh, Grandmaster Raven Sturt. Welcome, Raven. Hi. Thanks for Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to finally do this. It's been a long time in the making, and it's given me time to really dive into your content. So I'm grateful for that because I've I've learned a lot. So Raven, you're I think it's fairly rare to be a self-taught grandmaster, and obviously being a national high school champion, you were you know strong from a young age, but still strike me as one of these people who, rather than grandmaster being like a total afterthought, you had to work for it. Um, so during both this journey and your extensive work as a trainer, what have you learned about chess improvement? What do you think the core tenets are for getting better at chess? Uh, so I think, first of all, chess is a lot harder to improve at than we always think. I It took me, I think, like five years to make Grandmaster from IM. And I remember telling my friend after I made IM that I expected it to only take a year. So just in general, you can assume that you're always heavily overestimating the time it's going to take to reach your goals. Um I think like having a, a massive amount of self-reflection and an understanding of the way you're viewing the board and like being very objective about that is is also very important. Um, something that I really worked on that I think is probably the most critical or is the best way to explain this is often when you're looking at a game, you click the game review after and you you sort of convince yourself that you saw all these things that you didn't. And it's important just to be able to separate like what you were actually thinking during the game from what you should have been thinking. Well said. So what's your approach for that? Like when you play a game, you know, endless debate, do you look at the game right away with an engine or try not to? Where do you come down on those sorts of questions, Raven? Uh, So I find I just I find that I'm a very objective and like super rational person. So I think I can just be very honest with myself. And like I, I face the fact that I just completely misinterpreted something for other people, though. I don't know. Um. It's just the way I've always been. I've always like massively leaned into being self-critical and being super honest with myself. Um, but for other people, I would say definitely you want to write out all your your ideas first before showing it against the engine. Because I find that even among my students, a lot of them will will play a game and then they'll just convince themselves that they saw things that only after when they saw the game review did they have any idea were were going on. Yeah, hindsight bias is a hell of a drug. It's uh, it's hard to overcome it. <laughs> um, so, and I saw in your video, so I, I actually, you know, I often just kind of go without the video for testable course, but for yours, I used the video. And as far as I could tell, it didn't even look like you had the engine on when you were recording. Is that right, Raven? No, yeah, I try. Yeah, I just try to be as objective as possible. So for many years, I've been playing this thing called the evaluation game where I just try to guess the evaluation. And uh, I think now I'm always, almost always within like 0.2 or 0.3, which is nice. But, wow, that's yeah, amazing. Like that's another way. Yeah. So when I interviewed Matthew Sadler, and I ended up mentioning this in my book, um, he said something that I regret I didn't really follow up with him about because it kind of blew my mind the more I thought about it. So he said that these neural network engines like Leela, if you set their calculation to only two ply ahead, they still can play at like 
a 2400 to 2500 level just because their positional understanding is so incredible. Um, I know you mentioned some of Sadler's work in your chessable course. Um, does does that surprise you? Uh, n- not anymore. Now I know how strong computers are. In the past, if you had told me Deep Blue had that type of positional understanding, then that that would be a bit more surprising. But yeah, based on the way that you know all these computer geniuses are building these neural networks out, that would make sense that their positional understanding is far beyond what we would have assumed. That is that is honestly crazy though that they're able to play at a twenty five hundred level on only two ply. Yeah, I mean, and honestly, it even gave some hope to me as a human. I mean, not that I'm going to suddenly be at twenty five hundred, but just that even if you say your calculation is crap, you know, like if you can just limit the mistakes and increase your understanding, in theory, there should be some some runway for improvement. Although, as you said at the top, it's it's always way harder than we think it should be. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think um I think intuition and just know how in general, like know how I, I wanna yeah, it's it's important to like differentiate. Know how know how I guess is like applicational skill. It combines energy, intuition, and all these things. I think that especially when you're more focused on intuition, there's still an enormous room to improve. Yeah, there's there's know how and know that is the uh, yeah. the dichotomy in chess, uh, <laughs> the, the, the vast gulf. Um, and let me ask you, Raven, um, are most of your students adults or are they, um, you know, up and coming students like uh, adolescents or is it a healthy mix of both? It's a mix of both. I would say it's like 50-50 adults, okay. kids. Yeah. And what have you observed in the differences in both how adults approach chess and in their learning patterns, their results? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think kids can grow faster, but at the same time, in some ways, being an adult is better because you can more consciously understand the principles that I'm explaining. Like with when I'm teaching a kid, I have to water down the principles to some extent. I can't use such an advanced vocabulary. Um, and so I think there are advantages to being both. I definitely don't believe fully in the the idea or the the misconception, I would say, that adults cannot improve at chess. Okay. Um, so what do you think is those adults who do struggle, what do you think is holding them back? I think it's mostly just the time constraints. Like, yeah. I think it's just having a, a life, having a family. It's, it's a real struggle. Like, uh, to give some context, I thought Grandmaster was going to be super easy. I tried do making Grandmaster while like keeping a full-time job. And I realized I just wasn't going to be able to do it. So I literally took two years off and I was teaching maybe five hours a week just to pay the bills and keep the lights on for two years. Yeah, I wondered about that because you went to to McGill, you know, elite university. Um, according to your Wikipedia, you studied economics. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, no, that's correct. Okay, so yeah, so you did you did take a job outside of chess after university? Uh, so at, right after university, my mom had promised me that she would pay for a gap year if I I had stellar grades. And in in college, I had worked my butt off to get good grades, and so I enjoyed a gap year, and. Um, yeah, that gap year was really incredible. I came out of college being only twenty two fifty. Oh wow! And with, within three months, I was almost twenty four hundred. That's so amazing. I, I saw an enormous, like an astronomic rise. I nearly got a, a GM norm right after college, and that was crazy. And um, sorry, and, yeah, and then like since then, I'd always been trying to balance. You know, I I never really found finance interesting. I found some parts of it interesting, but I was mostly just in it for the idea of making a ton of money and then retiring. Um. But yeah, I just, it, it, it became too soul crushing for me to show up to interviews and lie. So with, after like two years, I just gave up on it. So did and you, did you work at all in the finance field or it never even happened? I got close. I did a few internships and I, I got very close to getting positions. Okay. Yeah. But then you've always been, been doing chess after, after your gap year. Yeah. I've been teaching, like I'd been teaching throughout since, since college, but for the first two years, I was really trying to get into finance and switch gears into that. Okay. And for your gap year, obviously, you no, know, I recently interviewed a, an adult amateur who's taking a year off to pursue chess um, in his early 30s. Shout out to Ben. It's like a dream. Obviously, you were stronger than um, most of the people listening. But but I mean, 2250 is, you know, I consider it an amateur level, um, even though you you might have been an FM, you were at least like in that yeah. In that I mean, neighborhood, fifty feet a. By the okay. way, okay, yeah, I should have specified. Yeah, I think you did. Um, so my my question, Raven, is like, 
what was your approach? Right? Were you traveling and playing a bunch, studying a bunch? I'd love to hear about your routine when you had uh, such progress. Yeah, I think I think the thing is, is you just need to really fully immerse yourself. Um, I mean, I, it's it's really this isn't the, the nicest advice for someone who's listening to this and has like a full time job, but um, I'm sure there are other ways to do it. But you would need to be, I don't know, like that. I honestly don't know how to go about that approach. Whenever, whether it was in the gap year or what, pushing for GM. I've just gone completely like all in on it and just started studying at least. Um, I think during the gap year, I was I was trying to study 10 hours a day, but I don't think it was the most effective 10 hours, though. I would say it was probably more around seven because there was if you're studying chess, but then also listening to music or you're studying chess, but you also have the TV on and ESPN is playing. And then that's going to that's going to mess with the productivity significantly. So I would have. I would say I was probably studying like seven good hours a day during the gap year. Yeah. And how yeah. much of it was, so, I mean, you mentioned maybe some multitasking, like how much of it was like opening work compared to calculation work, et, et cetera. So that's a, that's a really cool um, subject. At some point we should segue into the, the bird opening course, but pretty much until doing this bird course, I've not really focused on openings. Right. Yeah. You mentioned that in your chessable course. Um, yeah. I'd love to hear more, more about that. So what were you doing? Uh, I just, I like reading strategy and end game books. And honestly, it, it's been a bit to my detriment. And I can only see that now because in the last year before GM, I started working on openings. And so many of the problems that I normally have of just not knowing the theory and immediately getting into time travel just completely disappeared. And that that really improved my game. So I definitely am not recommending not to focus on openings at all. Um, but yeah, during the gap year, I was focusing a lot on visualization, doing blindfold stuff. I was trying to play blindfold games in my head. Um, I was working a lot on visualization because... At some point, uh, visualization, more than anything, it doesn't just help with calculation. It also helps with time management, right? Like if you can imagine a position in which like you're calculating a position three moves ahead, if your visualization isn't good, every single time you look at that position, you're going to have to go back first through the first three moves. And that's going to be like another 10 or 15 seconds. I feel seen, Raven. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you, you just described my thought process. Yeah, I don't have confidence. Well, I might say for good reason. I mean, you know, this is relative to my like 2100 USCF level or whatever. I, I don't feel like my confidence, my calculation is like a competitive advantage. And yeah, I waste so much time double checking stuff. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that, that's a place that actually that that ties directly into time management. I find that it's not that people who calculate one way or the other, they, they necessarily see different things, but one sees it so much quicker than the other. Yeah. So, like, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. From what I was going to say, um, from what I understand, I'm not sure if Hikaru does this exactly, but he gets the position in his head probably like five moves in advance. And then from there, he just looks at all the, the various tactics, right? He'll go through one variation. He'll go back to that position and then go to another. But it will in, in all the cases that that base position he's looking at is five moves ahead. Yeah. Um. So it sounds like you're basically saying if you are someone who encounters uh, issues like I do, which I think are common, the remedy, unfortunately, is uh, is hard work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bummer. Unfortunately. <laughs> okay. So, but so you worked a lot on your calculation and your visualization. Is that something like coming out of university as a 2250 player? Did you feel like that was a strength going into that period or were you trying to address a weakness or was it just normal for your level at that point? I just thought it was a way for me to improve my chess. Um, I think visualization helps in so many different ways. First of all, if you can picture, I could talk about this for like two hours. Like if, in, apart from just the time management and the fact that you're saving so much time, if you're able to hold that position in your head and really like look at it clearly, you'll be able to also make positional assessments. Yeah, and, which is kind of the theme of your course, right? Yeah. And so the idea is if you're just able to visualize a position well, not only you, can you calculate from it well, but you can also just make a much more accurate assessment than you would otherwise. Yeah. So circling back to what you said about sort of your ability to evaluate and how, I mean, it's somewhat unusual, I think, to practice that skill. When you would try to practice evaluating a position and you gave it a 1.3 and it's a 0.3 or, or worse yet, you know, a minus one. Like, what's your next step for for figuring out what you're missing? Um, so the, there is a there is a chance that it's just due to some tactic. And right. if there's some tactic, I'll just play around with the variations, and you'll see if there's a tactic. Um, for instance, it could be like your your main contr- like the main reason I thought white was better was because of their control for the d5 score, and it turns out due to a tactic that black can just like trade your knight off or win your knight. That was going to be the main piece controlling that square. 
something like that. Um, generally, if, if there's a tactic involved, I'll be way off. And those are much easier to understand. The ones that are not easier to understand is when I'm only like 0.5 off, because then it's not a tactic. It's just due to something, something very subtle in the position. So what do you do then? Um, there are various ways you can literally just tinker around with the position. Like you can just, uh, like I'm using, I'm talking about Lee chess now, but you just, you, you have the analysis board on, you have the assessment and then you just literally put a piece, you just tinker around with the position and place a piece on a slightly different square. And all of a, a sudden the evaluation will change by 0.5 or something. And then it will turn out that it's that piece. Okay. And have you tried this work with, uh, your students? No, I think this is too advanced. I think you need too too much of a, like a knowledge base to Right. Like if you have no base of reference, there'd be no way to even try like playing around with the positions. So if someone's listening and they say like what Raven's saying resonates with me, I'm not very good at judging positions, but I'm say 1500. Um, what what would you advise them? I could say you could try it, but there's going to be a lot of trial and error involved and it. It would be good to get a stronger player just to to help you like look through what you're doing just to make sure that just to be able to apply their own knowledge and make sure you're not missing anything obvious. Okay, yeah, and I will give a shout out to uh, friends of the pod, uh, Eugene Perlstein and Nate Solon's Evaluate Like a Grandmaster, which does uh, give puzzles to evaluate because the benefit then is obviously they actually explain. So um, you wouldn't be cast out to sea as you nice. would doing it in uh, in Raven style. So Raven, we've um, when I announced to uh, Perpetual Chess Patreon subs that you were coming on, uh, it turned out you have a few fans and possibly students among the the base. So we've got a couple good chess improvement related questions. I'm going to dive into the first one, which is from Tim Walters. Tim, thank you for helping to support Perpetual Chess. Uh, and Tim, so I'm going to read his, uh, his question uh, starting now. Tim writes... Mm -hmm. GM Sturt's course, Developing Chess Intuition, is incredible. A must-read for anyone 1,800-plus USCF. I'm impressed with how well-explained each example is and how logical the thought process is to get to the correct solution, especially for a course on intuition, which sounds difficult to teach and learn. I found this very logical decision-making process really resonates with me as someone who started to study chess as an adult. Then he asks... Was this more logical problem solving approach something you develop or strongly relied on during your push to GM as an adult? And he also asked, as a coach, have you found that this style especially resonates with and is most helpful for adult students? So kind of circling around the topics we we're already discussing, but I'd love to hear what you have to say. That's interesting. You're going to have to, there are a lot of questions at the end there. So you're going to have to make sure that I answer all of them. Okay. Do you, do you yeah. need me to repeat? <laughs> do you need me to repeat? No, I, one? I, I got, I got the basic gist. Um, the first thing is, is that I think when I'm playing in accordance with my course, I can play it like a 2300 USCF level, like without tactics or anything else. So I think that, yeah, th those intuition things definitely help adult players. So yeah, I guess that, that answers the, the last question. Um, adult players can definitely improve, uh, from just improving their intuition. It's very strange, honestly, a lot of the things that I mentioned in my course are things I picked up as I went from FM to GM, or, more or less all of them, at least I perfected or nuanced or tweaked in some way. Um, but I only had to really explicitize those things when I was trying to explain them to students. And so to that end, only because I had to, to teach them and explain them so many times, did I start to realize that actually this, this could just be a course, um, because yeah, I explained it in the intro of my course, but pretty much I was looking for some positional intuition resource to recommend to students, and there was just nothing out there. And so it seemed like the perfect idea. I have all these little positional intuition tricks that I tell my students, and I've worked really well for them, and so I'll just turn it into a course. Yeah, so you mentioned in the course, you envisioned it as sort of like a woodpecker method for, for positional ideas. Yeah, that's the idea. I think, have you looked at that example that I give, I think in chapter seven, where I, an IM just plays a relatively normal move and then all of a sudden I'm winning against him? It doesn't, doesn't ring a bell off the top. So you'll have to. So have to... yeah, there's just this position where um, I'm playing a Colombian IM, his FIDE is 2400. So he's a very strong player. And his knight is on the edge of the board. His knight is on H5. I have a pawn on D4 and I play knight E5 initiating a knight exchange. And after I take back, his knight is going to be completely marooned on the side of the board because my, my D pawn will have come to E5 and that, that knight on H5 will be locked out of the game. Um, but that was what really showed me the whole idea there, or yeah, I'm sorry for jumping around, but, um, he was just completely shocked by it at first and then he understood it. So the, the thing is, is that with a lot of positional ideas, it's easy for stronger players to understand them, but it's not so easy for them to be picked up on their radar at the same time. 
And you so mean the, like the once they're shown opponent, them, they can they can understand them? Yeah, like as soon as my opponent saw my move, he understood what it was and he understood he was much worse. But up until then, he was just, his body language had shown it. he didn't have any idea that there was any danger. Okay. And the idea is that it was only a two move thing or something. It was only like, literally, I move my knight and I take with the pawn and then his knight is completely locked out. And what that had showed me is that pretty much, you know, it's only a two move idea. If I shoot him a mate in two or a, a fork in two, he would have found it immediately. So it's just that we're not training this skill as much. Yeah. Um, so what did you discover? So you mentioned you you had to flesh out these ideas and turned it into your course um, when working with students. Like, what insights did you, what did you discover that you was harder than you expected to communicate to adult amateur students? Um. Well, it wasn't so much that it was difficult. It was that I had never really thought them through. I had never thought them out and just having to put them into language. Like, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's make sure we got all of Tim's questions. Um, oh, was it something you strongly relied on during your push to GM as an adult? Uh, in some ways, yeah. Because... Um, yeah, I found that like to make the jump from IM to GM, you just need to automate an, an enormous amount, right? You need to figure out what you're going to spend time thinking on and what you're just going to leave to automation. And yeah, the, the systems I, I describe in my course, especially chapter seven, chapter seven is really big. Chapter seven is about opening theory and how I assume grandmasters look at openings. I'm not sure if it goes for everyone, but um, like, for instance, uh, did, have you done chapter seven yet where the, we talk about like the knights? how the knight on f3 is always tangoing with the knight on c6? Uh, no. <laughs> All right, yeah, you have to get to it. It's it's a cool one, but uh, pretty much what I, I discuss is the fact that, you know, when you're playing your opening, you are you have a set of ideas, your opponent has a set of ideas, and that's, that's like, pretty standard. Everyone knows that. But what grandmasters do is they figure out, like, the most effective way to synthesize the, the middle ground between both of them. Okay. So they'll find the perfect way to play for their ideas while playing against their opponents. Okay. I'm moving that to the top of the list. I was hoping to get through the whole course. I did the first three chapters and then I skipped. I was excited for the end game studies chapter. So I skipped to that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it's all, uh, it's all excellent. And Raven, uh, bringing it back to, to your gap year. So like how big a part was competing um, during this period? Yeah, so I think I, I definitely disagree with the status quo about this. I don't think you need to play almost at all in that. the the How many tournaments would you guess that I played between 2250 and 2400? Yeah, I mean, had you not just prefaced it with what you did, I would have guessed uh, I would have guessed 40 or something. Uh, no, I only played, I think, what I played the World Open. I played two tournaments in Spain and Millionaire Open. Wow. So four, four tournaments. And then just endless calculation yeah I mean, it was just a lot of it was a lot of work like that was the idea i was just i was living in a tiny hostel in spain and just studying 10 hours a day wow um, now i wouldn't i wouldn't recommend it to everyone by the way it was psychologically very draining like that i didn't have any friends i would just my my best friend was this guy who worked at the deli across the street <laughs> that's funny because yeah. it seems to me like it's been a long time since i've stayed in, in a hostel but i you know i did used to enjoy it periodically when traveling and it seems like you just make friends. Like, did you, didn't you just have, have people passing through that would like distract you for days at a time? Uh, no, I was, I was super focused on chess. Like it, people, yeah. Random people would come to the hostel and I would talk to them, but you oh. know, apart from maybe like a 10 minute conversation over coffee, it was just back to chess. Wow. That's intense and, and admirable in a sense. I mean, the, you got the job done. Um, so, but that's really interesting because it, as you say, it does, it does go against conventional wisdom and actually the wisdom that, you know, the advice, I, I don't know if I call it wisdom that I give in my book. I'm, I mean, I've certainly in interviewing so many adult amateurs, I will say the vast majority of those who show progress um, compete extremely regularly. Um, but you obviously you showed that it's not necessary. And it's interesting because you wrote in your blog it's so my first thought was you must be a very practical player because I think part of the reason that uh, you need to play so much is because chess is a game of decision making. You know, mm -hmm. you can't be solved in a lab um, and you need stuff like time management. But you actually wrote about solving time management issues as well. So or I don't know, solving might be a stretch, but getting better at it. So how did you get better at the practical elements of OTB play while not playing that much? Uh, so. 
Yeah, that's a very good question. First of all, I would want to say that in general, probably your method works better because what I did is just, it, it, it's very psychologically draining. So even if it is slightly more effective to be able to sustain that um, for a long period of time is pretty much impossible, especially like even in my case, I think I burned out by December. So okay. from July to December, I was doing this. And then by December, I was already stopping to play as much. And then by February, I wanted to quit chess. And from February to like May of 2016, I didn't play at all. Okay. I was really, just really on, I, what is the word? Unromanticized from it. Right. Um, yeah. To, to get back to your point, um, over the board, I think a lot of it is just like thinking strategically. Um, I just noticed that I would get into time trouble all the times. And so I, I would just, uh, I more or less just strategized a way to, to work around it. And, um, my whole theory is that like, if you're ahead 10 or 15 minutes on the clock, that's equivalent to being plus one. Mm -hmm. Cause, uh, like, especially maybe when it's 60 minutes to 45, that's not so clearly felt, but when it's 20 minutes to five minutes, then that's an enormous advantage. That means you will essentially like have two extra long things while your opponent doesn't have any. Yeah. Yeah. Maxime Vashilagrav was just on C squared and, you know, he's known for playing pretty quickly. And he actually, he mentioned, um, that, you know, it's a conscious choice. Like sometimes it bites him, but he was saying like, he wants to be ahead on the clock, you know, like it, it, he considers it a competitive advantage. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite interesting. There's some grandmasters who have made it their entire style. Like there's this guy, he was recently on a, a chess base India video. He's a, a Georgian grandmaster, Giga Kuparadza. And he, I played against him in Armenia and his whole theory is he pretty much does not use any time. Wow. He literally like the end of the game happened. I ended up winning, but it, I had like five minutes and he had like 85, wow. something like that. And his whole idea is that it's very mentally draining to always have the clock be ticking on your side. So, well, I think that's why adults, one of the reasons adults can find it a bit uh, discomforting to play kids because kids often just let it fly, you know? Um, <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, you feel like you get no break, you know? Um, yeah. I think, yeah, I think to the extent that you can just make sure you're not making really big blunders and you're, you're playing relatively decently, I think that that strategy is very, uh, very effective. Yeah, agreed. But some, sometimes we, we get in our own head and it's like, it's hard to, you can, you can intellectually realize it might be an effective strategy, but then sit there and just want to check a move one more time or mm -hmm. so I've heard. Um, but Raven, I did want to follow up on one other thing because regarding your point about not playing OTB as often, this is something that I also wrote about in my book. Um, I just want to highlight the point that you were pretty young, you know, 22, 23, you know, I, I quote a few neuroscientists in the book saying that that's still an age where basically you can uh, form new neural patterns relatively effortlessly. Um, your brain is still not fully formed. So just spitballing here, but I think that may be part of the reason that you were able to sort of um, still improve your calculation um your calculation skills a lot, like just through training without through competition. Whereas when you get older, there's more distractions, you you know, and there may be biological like uh, brain related reason, reasons as well that make it more challenging to sort of learn in a study but not compete environment. Yeah, that could definitely be true. I also think just your advice for the most part would be better because it's it's psychologically draining. And the other thing is, is that if you're not enjoying the process, you're probably just going to quit. So playing playing tournaments, while it might not, while for some it, might, it still might not be as effective as what I did, it's you want to make it enjoyable so that you can continue it for years on end in the, the process of improvement. Yeah. Um, to your point about neural pathways, that I think that would definitely make sense when I was 22, but I also did the same thing when I was 26 in Peru and making a, a final push for GM. Yeah. I mean, the, the quote I have from Dr. Huberman in the book and Christopher Chabri basically said the same thing is like it's around the age of 25, but it's not hard and fast. And it's also like it's not like a cliff, you know, it's like a, you know, it's like a hilltop. <laughs> so like, you know, you, your your ability to sort of uh create new neural pathways peaks around 25 and then very slowly goes down. So I think, mm -hmm. and I think that's part of the reason um, that most of the, the people who, who, the adult amateurs who I've interviewed, who've had outlandish rating jumps, like more often than not, they took place in the twenties. And I don't want to discourage anyone listening over 30. I'm over 30. And if you listen to my interview with Todd Bryant, um, you will hear that there are cases out there certainly of people who've gained hundreds and hundreds of points past the age of 30. Um, but 
I, I do think it's pretty undeniable that it, it does get more difficult. And as you as you talked about, Raven, like some of the difficulty reasons could just be life circumstances, but we can't pretend those don't exist, you know, unless you're like as a listener, if you're in like some extremely unusual circumstance uh, where you can you can devote, you know, 30 hours a week. Uh, lead lead Raven's monk like existence, uh, pursuing chess. Then, then you know you can explain it away as life circumstances, but it doesn't change the basic facts. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Raven, or we can go on to the next no, question. No, I, I, I agree. I would largely agree. Yeah, improving in your twenties is definitely easier. Yeah. Um, okay. So next question related to chess improvement is from Paulo Santana. I believe he's from. Oh, um, I know him. Yeah. Oh, nice. He's, is he's he is Portuguese or Brazilian? He's Brazilian, but I, I first played against him like in 2007 in New York. Okay. Yeah, yeah. we've exchanged a few emails uh, over the years. Uh, shout out to Paulo, and we'll talk later about your affinity for Brazilian culture and your um, <laughs> your work on the um, Portuguese language. But for now, let's get to this question. So Paulo asks, he says, I've trained with Raven, and one of his specialties is blindfold chess. He'd like to know how you got so good at it and what role that had in your progress as a chess player. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned this, but we didn't really drill down. So, uh, I pretty much just brute brute force. Uh, blindfold is very interesting. Have you tried it at all? A little bit. I'm I'm also weak for my rating. You know, getting back to the calculation discussion, I feel like yeah. I'm weak for my rating at blindfold chess. Okay. Um, yeah, blindfold Blindfold is very strange. I mean, I'll just describe the way I developed. I'm not sure if this applies to everyone, but pretty much when you start out playing blindfold, um, up until like 2015 or 2016, I hadn't tried working on it at all. So this was already a, around the age of 22 or 23. Um, and I would just try to read entire games and magazines with without a board and try to go over all the variations and just really understand every comment. Um, this is very taxing. Like a lot of... if if. If I tell you that, it might seem not that hard just to picture the board, but keep in mind, you also have to understand all of their comments with their positional assessments, and that, that makes it very challenging. And uh, the way the blindfold worked for me, it's it's really strange. Uh, you start out just seeing the board as like these tiny little sections conglomerated, right? Like you'll see the section from A1, A2, B2, B, B1, like those four four square blocks, and you'll be able to like see each individual one in your head, but you won't be able to connect them. And slowly but surely, the, the, the radius of these squares gets bigger and bigger until you can picture the whole board. So, yeah, just to explain what I'm saying. In no, case I that follow. Clear, go on. Sorry, go ahead. The whole idea is like these two by two blocks. You, yeah. can see, you can think about each individual one and process it, but you can't process how they relate and coordinate with all the other squares. And you'd have to like consciously rotate from from block two by two block to two by two block. And eventually that becomes three by three, four by four, but through no conscious effort. It's crazy. Wow. I've had I've had that experience where I, I'm like, I don't know what's going on in the whole board, but I, I know <laughs> I know what's going on in this this little section. But I didn't consciously I haven't trained blindfold as obviously as extensively as you. So I didn't consciously put it together, A, that that might be normal and B, that that's something to like build upon. You know, I sort of felt like I should be able to see the whole board, you know, <laughs> like, whereas instead you, you, you could tell yourself this is a start, you know? Yeah, no, there's definitely, definitely at the start, you're not going to be able to see the whole board. Um, I think it's crazy though, that like through no conscious effort, like the, the, your brain naturally processes two by two, then three by three. And then eventually it was, once it got to around five by five, there was a very quick jump between that and an eight by eight. Okay. And have you done like blindfold timos and stuff like that? Yeah, uh, I try to do them once a month on my Twitch stream. I, last time I played seven people. Wow. And how is that like, how taxing is that for you? It's pretty exhausting. So it, feel, it feels like I ran um, like a half marathon or something. So many years ago, I did a book review podcast with a friend of the pod, Jerry Wells, about this book, Blindfold Chess, where they go through all the legends, Pillsbury, Koltanowski, you know, um, and... It's like a strong undercurrent in this book that people who do too much blindfold chess um, go crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do, do you think there's any uh, any truth to this? Raven? I can definitely imagine that. Um, I think just chess in general, there's always a little risk because it's something that you can get so obsessed and fixated over. Yeah. Yeah. And and then, of course, there's like a chicken or egg argument, you know, the whole the famous quote about. Uh, yeah, maybe our personalities are selecting for it. Yeah. And like maybe it keeps crazy people sane rather than 
uh, making sane people crazy. Um, but but anyway, so bringing it back to Paulo's question, um, what constructive, like when you do do blindfold work with your students, so you mentioned trying to envision little quadrants. If you're, if you're working with a student and you read the first 10 moves of a game and they're just like, I have no idea what, you know, what's going on in the position, like what do you do then? I think... I mean, perhaps other people who have done more work on this have better ideas. I think it's mostly iteration. So the idea is if you can get to five moves in your head, then that's great. And hopefully next game you can get to six moves. Okay. Have you yeah. read, I know you're a big chess bibliophile, which we should get into. Have you read Tisdall's Improve Your Chess now? Uh, no, who, who's that by? Uh, Grandmaster Jonathan Tisdall. No, I haven't. That, okay. You would, was an you older would, author, right? Like he probably, that was published in the 90s, I would assume. Yeah, but New and Chess just came out with a new edition, which I actually haven't, I haven't checked out the new edition yet. Um, but he, you would enjoy uh, hearing his thoughts on on calculation and uh, and blindfold. And he gives nice. little blindfold puzzles. And, you know, he was pretty far ahead of his time. There wasn't, wasn't much going on. Um, there wasn't as much explicit mention in literature, as far as I know, um, at that time. Now, this is something else I touch on in my, my book. So there's, there's blindfold work, and then there's calculation and visualization work. Do you consider them one in the same, distinct skills? And, um, and like, what sort of advice would you give for someone who's, who wants to get better at visualization? Um, sorry, you take it from there. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, I want to preface that like blindfold work, while it's cool, while it's like a, a nice parlor trick, objectively it's one of the least returning the lowest returns on investments okay uh, i gently said efficient. that in my book so i'm glad to i'm glad to hear you reinforce that go on yeah like i definitely like it it's cool and also i mean there is it, it doesn't help your chess necessarily but it does help your chess training because then you can read books on the go right that's a good so point in, in some ways it is it is better but to like the actual gameplay itself not that much okay um, yeah, I would say visualization is like a hundred times as useful. Just being able to look at a board and like play a few moves in your head and having like a concrete. Of course, they are similar. Like if your blindfold is better, you it, when your blindfold gets good enough, you won't even be need, need to look at the board when you're calculating variations. Right. That's why like Hikaru and all those guys are just looking up into into thin air. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, it's definitely not necessary. I would say like visualization is probably ten times as useful. Okay. And you mentioned you're a big fan of endgame studies, Kasparian's classic domination in particular. So uh, am I jumping to the, a conclusion that you would consider that to be sort of more constructive in terms of chess improvement? I'm not sure if that's that improve, uh, that's, that's that instructive. I, I really love that, that book, and I think it's good for imaginative things. Um, yeah, I, I would, I'm not, like, what are we comparing this to? Are we comparing it to endgames in general or just all improvement devices? Yeah, um, maybe we should tackle it a different way and say, um, say median chess student has 10 hours a week um, to study chess, like what should they do? Uh, so yeah, there are a few things. Um, I don't think, I think the end game, that domination in 2545, I just find that fun. So I think to the extent that it's important to make your training fun, because then you're, you're more likely to do it, it's, it's great. Uh, it develops some imagination I don't think it's the most critical thing though. Like doing the first hundred domination puzzles, a lot of the devices are the same. A lot of the ideas are the same. So there's definitely like an overkill to it that you could you could do. Um, if you're spending 10 hours, I would say, I don't know, maybe like an hour on on that, like three hours on proper end games, something like Devretsky's or wow. Silman's. That's like uh, unconventional advice. Um, I mean, obviously not Devoretsky's Endgame Manual itself, but 30% of uh, of your time on Endgames. And you would say, like, study them as a standalone? Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big, big Endgame fan. I've been through Devoretsky's like seven times. Wow. It's, yeah, it's something I'm, I'm, it's like my favorite book. And do you try I, to I memorize the, I, the positions they say to memorize? No, I've never bothered memorizing it, but it's just, I've thought about them for so long. A lot of, I could probably recite to you like a third of the book wow. right now. Yeah. And when, what level were you when you started that book? Uh, I went over it the first time in 2008 when I was 14 years old, but back then I, I didn't really have any discipline. I just looked like, I just liked looking at the diagrams. Okay. But um, yeah, in after college, I really tackled it and really. And you really were what, like, say 1900, 2000? What, what was your rating? No, I, was 20, I was already 2200 feet at that time, but I was, uh, to give you like a, 
some perspective on how long it took. It took me two months, like two to three hours a day. Wow. Yeah. But I just, I literally did everything. I solved all the puzzles and that was actually like the proof is in the pudding, right? That was the same time I made that massive jump and I was nearly making GM norms as a 2,200 feet. Day. Wow. Okay. So 30, sorry. So we got sidetracked. So 30% end games. What else? Uh, yeah. So yeah. So 10% domination, 25, 45, 30% end game. Um, I would say only 15% openings. I really don't think openings should take that much time. Openings are funner for people to study because they seem so tangible. So that's why I think they get so so overfocused. And this but, is even at the say twenty two hundred level, or does it start to yeah, change? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, my my opinion is very unorthodox. So, but so fifteen percent that maybe fifteen percent grandmaster games, and what does that leave? That leaves thirty percent. So thirty percent should be on just training your focus. We okay. haven't talked about this yet, but this is what I did in Peru. Pretty much, you look at a board, you look at it until you get bored, and then you just try to focus for another five minutes. Wow. So, like, how long per study session? Uh, I was doing this in Peru and this, I think this is what made the massive difference between me being 2,400 and me being 2,500 FIDE. Like the, I think this was one of the biggest reasons why I jumped from IM to GM. Um, I would go to, a, I would go to a cafe. I wouldn't bring anything. I would just bring a chess book and a watch and I would try to focus on a position. I would take the position normally from Agard's, Agard's, uh, collection, something like strategic play. Strategic play, I think is one of the best books. Have you done that one? No, it's, it's a really good one. Uh, like all the puzzles in it are fantastic. And I would just try to focus for 30 minutes. I would feel myself getting bored and tired and I would just force myself to keep thinking for five minutes. Wow. Yeah. It was extremely uncomfortable, but like right after that, I, I went up 70 points that summer. Yeah. I mean, a, a large, I feel like a large sort of, I mean, there's two strains of thought in chess. Basically there's what you said about, you know, you've got to do something you enjoy because if you don't, you're going to burn out. And like, what good is it anyway? But then there's also the Jonathan Rousen quote, chess improvement begins at the edge of your comfort zone, sort of what you're alluding to. You know, you've got to you've got to push, you've got to build, you know, do hard things, build difficult skills. And it's funny because I sort of feel like they're both true. You know? Yeah, <laughs> um, Yeah. exactly. I think, by the way, just to, to touch back on it, I think in general, it's this is a skill that's extremely uncomfortable to develop. No doubt. It was uncomfortable for me, but it's um. I can notice it in a lot of my adult students as well. Like I'll tell them to think for five minutes and they literally can't. And it's right. I'm not trying to like call them out or anything. It's just, it's too uncomfortable. So you like, it's too uncomfortable just having an idea that you know might be right, but you need to verify and you need to check and you need to stay in that sort of gray zone. It's so much easier for your brain to just immediately assess something, whether it's good or bad or not. Even if you, you know for a fact, you're not, you're not really certain about your assessment. It's I think yeah. like Rosen talks about this in Chess for Zebras that like so many of us like like the lazy detective. Yep. Yeah. That that's me. Yeah. And it, it's it, that's part of why I I come back to advocating for OTB because at least for me, like I I can focus, you know, and I can push through those uh, mental barriers when when I'm playing over the board. But the as I've gotten older, with you know uh, more going on outside of chess. I found it harder to to push through those barriers uh, away from OTB chess. And I, I'm, again, I'm not advocating it. And, you know, maybe I, I still hope there'll be some period of energy where I can like really work hard. But, you know, the, um, I think I'm certainly not alone in struggling with this stuff. Yeah, no, I, I definitely sympathize with that. I think now where I am as well, I, I was just in an extremely focused mindset back then it, it's unbelievably uncomfortable to do what i did mm -hmm. um and beyond that yeah you're figuring out a way to sort of stretch your comfort zone while making it fun and that that sounds ideal yeah because yeah if there's more on the line right like if you if you if you work your butt off and then it's just uh you've solved the puzzle but your rating hasn't changed at all that that just seems a lot less tangible a reward yeah yeah and there's also the the social element and yeah the, the competitive element, there's a lot that goes into it. But anyway, again, not not advocating, but the fact that, that yeah, that Rousen calls it a lazy detective, obviously it's an, an archetype and an understandable one. I mean, we've all we've all got, you know, more important things in life than chess to, to grapple with. Um, so so Raven, let's talk chess books. I mean, I know I, I feel like we're kindred spirits. I mean, I know you're a big fan of uh, Under the Surface. 
Um, I'm uh, despite not having done uh, Agar's positional book, I'm a big fan of his work generally, and have read most of his books. It's it's the the solving <laughs> that I need to work on. Uh, what are your some other favorites of yours, or if you would like to, you know, discuss why you love those books, I'm sure listeners would like to hear it. Yeah, it's it's interesting you mentioned this. I we haven't published it yet, but on my YouTube channel at some point, I did a book review of like the the 120 books I read. Oh, nice. Okay, it's, it's a three hour video. Like my editor is making sure to edit it. And um, but in terms in terms of the top ten, uh, I had like a special tier for the books I really love. Davretsky's Endgame Manual would have to be one. Um, I'm not sure if I put it in the top tier, but Positional Play by Davretsky and Yusupov is also a great one. I really love that one. Um, that's great. What else is great? Under the Surface was fantastic. Under the yeah. Surface was mind-blowing. Chess for Zebras, um, I'm really not sure if it was just a completely, um, what is that called? Like the placebo effect? But I was stuck at 2300 for like five years or 2200 feet A, like 2250 feet A, 2280 feet A for like five years. Mm -hmm. And then after finishing that book and letting that book crystallize in my mind, that coincided with me just putting so much effort into chess and trying to stretch my brain patterns and just rewire my brain and i i feel like even if the crux of that book is just you need to think about chess differently I, it seems simple but i think it's so profound like everyone thinks that they can just add a certain amount of knowledge to their same type of thought patterns and that's gonna make the big difference when in fact you have to change the thought patterns themselves to some yeah. extent yeah fan fantastic book and i will say for listeners most of these books are best suited for say 17 1800 and over you can uh, interject if you disagree, but chess for zebras, uh, a David Franklin and I did a podcast about it. Um, it. So listeners, curious listeners who haven't heard that can learn a little more about it. But also, I would say it's best suited for seventeen and eighteen hundred high and higher. But um, among the other books we've discussed so far, it's the most accessible. Like you will, you know, he was one of the first, as I mentioned in my book, quoting Rouse, one of the first people to write about sort of the gap between knowledge of skill, knowledge of, and skills. And there's just so many little useful tips that I think anyone over say 13, 1400 can, can learn from it. But, but you, again, you could add something or you could get back to your, your top 10 list, which I want to hear the rest of, or even, uh, yeah, I definitely agree with that. I really loved, you know, there, some people I've talked to the, I've talked about this with some people and they're not certain if it was due to Rosen's book that I made that jump. But I think that book definitely had me thinking about the right things. It definitely gave enormous food for thought. Um, yeah, to return to my top 10, Strategic Play by Agar. And I think that every book in that Grandmaster Preparation series is fantastic. But I think Strategic Play in particular, um, something I noticed is that when I was like 22, 2300 feet, a, the puzzles I was really struggling on. And then when I got around GM level, I was starting to get the puzzles. So it's literally, it's, it's completely set at the right mark of, you know, once you start getting these puzzles, you will be solving at least these positions at a GM level. Okay. And I'm trying to think about the rest. Honestly, I can't remember. I mean, you, other... you quoted game changer a bunch of times in your course. I like game changer, but I, I only read that after making GM. So I can't, I can't count that in my top 10. It was a nice book though. I, I really liked, uh, some of those alpha zero positions are incredible. Yeah. You mentioned Shankland's books. Uh, Shankland. I didn't, I didn't actually read Shankland's books. I know I I've seen some lectures. Ah, on, okay. I think you were referencing the, the pawns don't move backwards in your court in your yeah, course. I just seen that St. Louis, uh, chess club lecture that he gave okay. after publishing that book. And yeah, I think it was, it was very good. And so I just, I might've said that he talks about in his book. Um, I definitely didn't read the book though. I, I read sections of it. It's good from what I've read. It's good. Yeah, no, I, I'm in the same boat. It's sitting there on my shelf somewhere, but I, I haven't read it cover to cover. And but yeah, universally lauded, and obviously he's a, a brilliant uh, individual. Um, and yeah, kind of, you know, I, I do you consider yourself a late bloomer in chess? I mean, I know you started at eight and were like a scholastic champion, but by the standards of a grandmaster, I sort of consider you a, a late bloomer. Do you? What about yeah, you? Yeah, I definitely would. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I and Shanklin, similar story, um, but I would characterize him uh, the same way. Um, so let's talk a little more about. Uh, so I know you've got affinities for travel and languages, like, um, and even going to university in Canada after growing up in New York. I mean, obviously, you know, culturally similar, but but somewhat unusual. Like, what do you think frames your sort of 
um, global citizen outlook, Raven? Like, where did that come from? Uh, I just, I grew up watching a lot of international films. And so I could tell that there was just this enormous variety of culture out there. And I don't know. I just, I, I've been pretty bored by America. America's nice. America's fine. I have a lot of friends in America, but it's, uh, it's just, I, I've never been that attached to English. I like foreign languages. So okay. I, I spent a lot of time traveling. I think in 2019, I decided I was going to travel the world. And at the same time, I was going to be able to study a lot of chess and just live abroad in these random countries. And uh, yeah, I discovered Brazil. I think Portuguese is by far the best foreign language. I'm going to definitely get a lot of enemies for saying that, but it's it's really, really beautiful language. And um, yeah, I had lived in uh, I had lived in China, Turkey, Peru, Spain, wow. Hungary. Um, I'm probably missing one. Yeah, Brazil as well. Now Paraguay. Um, I definitely consider Brazil to be the best. There, wow. there are some crime issues in the cities, but where I was in the South, it was completely safe. And it seemed like by far like the best deal I've ever, I've so ever seen. Anyway. What, what do you like about it? Um, pretty much everything. Like the people are very warm. They're very friendly. The language is beautiful. The music is great. Uh, steaks cost like $5. Right. So. <laughs> I have been to Argentina. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so some are familiar with that dynamic, yeah, which is amazing. Um, and how's your Portuguese coming along? It's going well. Uh, I think I'm, I I could call myself fluent. Uh, it's obvious to people that I'm a foreigner, but it, I'm still pretty much able to speak without making mistakes. So. Okay. And your yeah. Spanish? Spanish is okay. Spanish is, uh, Spanish, it's, I'm probably at like a B1 level. Okay. Yeah, so like lower intermediate. I, I, can, I can explain all of the, the essential things that I would have to in any type of emergency or anything, but like speaking profoundly about anything is way beyond. Okay. And yeah, your and Raven, your relocation to Paraguay was somewhat recent. Like, would you say that you're an emigre or you're just living there? Like do you have, have, how far ahead have you mapped this out? Uh, so the, I mean, the, the, the plan is ultimately to live in Brazil, but right now the, the government, the Brazilian government is making like getting a permanent visa to Brazil, extremely difficult. I would need to buy a house like for a quarter of a million dollars or something. Okay. Either that or marry someone. So because those options for me are not on the table yet, I'm just chilling in Paraguay and I'm, I'm in this border town. So I'm able to go over to Brazil whenever I want and speak Portuguese and enjoy Brazilian culture. Get, get on the Brazilian dating apps and then just, <laughs> just cro cross the border. <laughs> um, and uh, bringing it back to chess, Raven, like, so you're extremely well traveled in chess, obviously, as well, like, you know, Citrus International, which you tied first, which is amazing. You went on a tangent in your chessable course about like some tournament in Greece that sounded amazing. So do you have uh, chess tourist recommendations for amateur players, like uh, big opens they could play in? Yeah, definitely. I do. By the way, I do want to just uh, clarify something. The Sid Chase International, I did win. I tied for first in the Sid Chase International, but that's a slightly weaker tournament than Sunway Sid Chase. Ah, it's not okay. the tournament with these 2700s. It's a tournament in the summer. And there were some GMs playing. It was a strong tournament, but it wasn't, I wasn't winning over people like Pragnananda or anything. Okay. The, I appreciate your honest <laughs> clarification. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, chess tourists, uh, I definitely, I would say that Western Europe or Northern Europe are probably the easiest to gain rating in. I don't mm -hmm. know. I, I would assume like Americans, if Americans are 2400, then that would be the equivalent of like a Spanish 2450 or a, a Scandinavian 2450. Greeks are underrated. Armenians are extremely underrated. Armenians are unbelievably underrated. I Last time I was in Armenia, I like signed up for a tournament. This is after I'd made the GM title. And I just thought it would be a nice way to go for vacation. And, you know, I'll just, I won't really prepare and I'll play some games. Maybe I'll lose a few ELO. Within four games, I was down like 20 ELO. And so I just immediately... It just ruined my vacation pretty much. I, I ended up dropping out of the tournament because I was there to relax. I wasn't there to play seriously. And I was every single game. Um, Armenia just has such a system. You'll be paired against a 1700, but the 1700 will have a GM like assigned to him to look at your games, analyze them and prepare for you. Wow. So, yeah, it's it's an extremely uphill battle. I think Armenia was a really cool country. There's a lot of Soviet heritage there. So it it makes the architecture very interesting. And ultimately, it was a really cool place. But if you're go, do not go to Armenia to gain rating. It's not going to happen. You're going to be playing against 1700s who play like 2100s. Yeah, or and one of the few countries with a nationwide chess curriculum as well. So probably probably not unrelated. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 
yeah, just to provide some context, my first game there, I was playing an Iranian girl. I think she was only 11 years old and she played eight moves of like opening theory and it was clear she had prepared against me. And I just thought, you know, I'll just surprise her with this move. And it was a move that I, from what I, what I understand is like, not even like the main sideline, it's a sideline to a sideline. And she knew immediately what to do. And I was down on the clock and I had to scrunch to a draw. Jeez. I was losing at one point. So there's just an enormous amount of preparation and enormous amount of work that goes into the games of people around the Caucasus area, like Iran, Kazakhstan, um, Armenia. I think Hans Neiman talked about in a clip recently that like he hated playing against these Kazakhs who were like 2100 rated, but would play like GM. So it's, huh. yeah, so it's, yeah um, it's an, I would no say stick to Western Europe. I've heard apparently Italy has the most overrated players. I've never played there. Um, okay. But, this is a, this is a deep scouting report. Now, what about, <laughs> what about just enjoying yourself? Like, was there any tournament you went to with like around the day that you found particularly in like an open that you found particularly enjoyable? I really liked, um, there's an open at the, in the really, the deep South of Brazil called the Floripa open. That's nice. It's pretty big actually. Um, most of the the games are one round a day. And so you're just able to enjoy this, this really beautiful place. And I think a few of the days are two rounds, but most of them are one round a day. Okay. Yeah. That was good. Also, oh, uh, how could I forget? There's, there's some tournaments in Crete, which are beautiful. There's the Rathimno open. And the Paliohara Open. Um, I think one of them got canceled due to funding, but the Paliohara is still going. Okay. It's spelled P-L-E-O-C-H-O-R-A. Uh-huh. Those tournaments are really beautiful. They're in like this beautiful Greek resort town. Uh, it's relatively untouched. You're not going to see any McDonald's or any H&M, <laughs> H&M stores there. And uh, yeah, it's really cool. I mean, but then again, you are rolling the dice because Greek players are pretty underrated. Okay. I would say Greeks are generally like at least 100 points underrated. Okay. Well, we got to we got to all, you know, we've all got to bury our rating concerns and <laughs> you know, just to just accept the plummet. <laughs> so, I'll, by the way, I'll put a link to uh, all of the tournaments mentioned for anyone uh less constrained than I am <laughs> to to actually uh go and attend uh some of these. And Raven, are you competing uh actively these days? Uh, so I just, I, I'm trying to focus on, I just spent the past two years pretty much emptying my bank account to make GM. So I'm trying to replete the, <laughs> nice. replete the funds at this point. Um, I'm planning on only playing a few tournaments. I just want to play some strong opens. So th- there were these tournaments in Qatar and the UAE. I'm going to, hopefully they'll, they'll renew them for next year and I'll, I'll aim to play in those. And then apart from that, I want to play in the world rapid and blitz. That would be cool. That would be amazing. Yeah. Um, so are you targeting next year or just like someday? Probably next year. I hope to to play next year. Okay. I've been saying next year for a while now, so I do I do need to to act on it. And if point. if you were to play that, like would you develop a particular training regimen for Rapid and Blitz or would you kind of just treat it as a normal tournament? Um, I would treat it as a normal tournament, but I think I would be very uh like well equipped for it cuz uh like right now we we haven't mentioned it yet, but I, I made a course on the bird. It hasn't come out. It's not going to come out for months, but uh, I've been using it online and I've been I've been scoring incredibly with it. Nice. The, the yeah. So is, this is one F four, and it's going to be on Chessable. Is that right? Yeah, and I, I'm doing it jointly with Simon Williams. So I did all the variations, and he's presenting it. Okay, great. Yeah, that that should be fun. Uh, I yeah, could see Simon. I mean, as a lifelong <laughs> Dutch player, like you know, I, I mean, I know he's played D four as as white but I, the bird seems like it's uh it's up his alley as well yeah it definitely is um yeah i think like i have a very like well-equipped repertoire for this quick st- style of just get your opponent to an, or- an unorthodox structure and they won't have enough time to figure it out yeah and also you know with uh ben feingold's dictum of never play f6 slash never play f3 if you go one f4 <laughs> you don't you don't have to worry about it no, you definitely don't. <laughs> okay. We have one more question from a listener. This one actually was just to, to ask someone, but I think you're a good person to ask, especially given your uh, global perspective and um, lack of enthusiasm for some American institutions from what we've heard. So this is from David Ham, who recently helped me out reviewing Soman's uh, Amateur Mind. Thanks. Shout out to David. And he asks, he says, I hear so much complaining about the U.S. style tournament and having multiple rounds a day. Why are there not more tournament organizers in the U.S. who respond to this sentiment and offer one round a day tournaments? 
Oh, I, that's the reason I don't play American chess. I hate American chess for that reason. Yeah. I, I completely agree wholeheartedly, but I think it's just not profitable. Yeah. I everything. And in... also like in, in a European tournament, you're normally, they arrange for you to only have to pay like 30 or $40 a night for a hotel. But with American tournaments, it's, it's going to probably be like $130, $150. I, I, I recommend most of my students to just save, save some time on their calendar and then play in Europe because apart from the airfare, everything else is much cheaper and it's much better quality. Um, I don't want to make any enemies with Goichberg, but I really like not having to bring my own set to tournaments. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's insane. I mean, I will give a shout out to the Charlotte Chess Center. I mean, they're still doing two rounds a day for the most part, but they are providing chess sets. I interviewed. Yeah, uh, I, sorry, go I've ahead. seen photos of them. I've never been there, but I've seen. Yeah, they have a really nice environment there. Yeah, they're they're advancing the, the paradigm for sure. And, uh, you know, there's other directors both in the, in and out of the US following in their footsteps but yeah to get back to to David's question i mean everything in america is for better or for worse you know <laughs> profit driven um and yeah you just you can't make money um the US open david uh is around a day um and is a nice chess vacation if you can make it that's about the best you can do uh within the u.s um obviously it's, it's in a different location every year but it's fun uh i haven't been in a long time but you know they have different side events and stuff so if you want to play more than once a day you can play in like action quads during the day um you can even skip the main event and just play quads here and there and like attend lectures and stuff so uh, the u.s open is nice um but and then as you get around the world open uh i'm not a big fan of uh most of the approach of CCA as well, um, Raven, but they do have like the, they call it the Philadelphia International, but then there's also like, I think a, an amateur focused one that's mostly yeah. around today. Um, yeah, those, those could be fun. Um, yeah. yeah, I've never played in US Open, but that's a really cool one. I don't know why they don't make that um, eligible for norms, though. Yeah, that's what I can understand. Like, that's the perfect tournament for it's like the one American truly international tournament. Yeah, like well, I think they probably side. feel like no one would play a strong enough field, you know, because it goes from zero to 2,600. So I think it would just be hard to, you know. I think would... for IM norms, that would be doable, though, because the for IM norms, you just need an average of 2,230, right? And you're allowed to bump the your first opponent up to 2,100 or okay. 2,050. Yeah. But anyway, uh, David, to play a game a day, you're almost better off just looking for a, a local you know, a local club play once a week, one, you know, one weeknight sort of thing. It's, it's hard, but hopefully Raven has given you some ideas about uh, potential chess vacations outside of uh, the U S and in the meantime, you know, like um, in the meantime, you can take buys <laughs> if you're not trying to, or trying to earn a norm. Um, it's uh wasteful of money in some sense, but, um, but could be the best, the best way to go. Um, so do you, so Raven, you're, you mentioned you'd like to play in the world rapid and blitz. Like, are you training, uh, these days in your game or are you kind of, um, foot off the gas for that, from that for now? I'm relatively foot off the gas, but I'm trying to get my, my chess.com rating above 3000. So I'm training to some extent in that. Okay. Uh, I'm just, yeah, I'm working on my repertoire. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to toot my ho own horn that much, but I think for like for Blitz and Rapid, the bird is the bird opening is going to start to gain in popularity because it's it's really fantastic. Last week I beat Lanier Dominguez with it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, in the title mm -hmm. Tuesday. So it's like people think it's a joke and that's the perfect type of surprise weapon, right? The perfect type of surprise weapon is something that's decent, but something that your opponent's just going to be so relaxed against that before he knows that he's going to be in in danger that he can't get out of. Yeah, I mean, I've probably played, I have no idea, but let's say I've played a thousand tournament games in my life. I've faced the bird twice, you know, like it, yeah. you just never see it. How's the from? Like, is it bad? From, or? I, I really hate the from. I, um, <laughs> I've, been, I've been starting, it started, it started honestly like triggering a reaction to me because it's just, it's, it's complete. It's almost lost unless they like, they, unless, unless black knows exactly what they're doing. They're just, they're usually lost by move 10. So the idea is that you just need to dodge this minefield of tricks. Uh -huh. And most of that is just based on like finding the first two moves after the from. Like if they go for G5 stuff, you have to play G3 and then just prepare to put your knight on H4. Okay, uh, we should give the moves. Uh, yeah, can... like F4, E5, F takes E5, pawn D6, pawn takes D6, bishop takes, and they're the, in that position, they're threatening checkmate. So you have to play knight F3. 
And then people will play G5 there. That's the most popular response. And you play G3, they play G4, and you play Knight H4. Okay. Um, so the reason that this gambit is terrible, though, is because you're only losing your F, or Black is losing both central pawns, and they're only getting our F pawn. So we're up a pawn, and we have a fantastic center long term. Yeah. Okay. So uh, <laughs> it's fun I to play in Blitz. I never, like, I knew, I basically knew as far as D6 takes, Bishop takes, and that's <laughs> it. I don't even think I was playing G5, but um, is D, so what's the best response to uh, 1F4? Well, F4, I'm happy to say it's just equal. It's, yeah. uh, it's not better. There, there are some positions where the computer rates them as like minus 0 0.05, meaning black is slightly better, but objectively, that's pretty much equal. And if you're if you have way more experience than your opponent, that's going to matter so much more. Right. Um, like I took on the bird course mainly because I thought it would be cool. I'm I'm the only GM I think with a, a name of a bird. Right. <laughs> so that's what I was. That's what I took on the contract for. But it's turned into I'm I'm really sold on the bird. I'm sold. I'm gonna at least for the foreseeable future, unless I get sort of tired of playing it, I'm gonna be playing it in every single tournament, whether wow. classical. Because I yeah, it's uh. Okay, it's equal, but literally, like, now there's so many positions after D4 that are equal. I tried getting my GM norms. Um, do you know the semi-tarash defense now where D4, they play, it's not the normal semi-tarash, but they just respond to C takes D5 with C takes D4? I've seen those and, positions, yeah. Yeah, they're just, they're zeros, according to the computer. So if you're going to play a position that's zeros, why not play one that at least you're going to have so much more experience than your opponent in? Yeah, and it's, you know, imbalanced, at least, in in some sense. Like, it's, you know, not symmetrical like that. Um, yeah. And what what are your plans for your YouTube channel, Raymond? Uh, my plans are, we're going to try to make a lot of high-quality content. We're figuring out a way to get it done. We were trying to do daily uploads, but we recently... Um, like moved away from that because it's just too much. It's too challenging to make daily videos. Like, because we want to put, we want to put a lot of work into them. We want to like have them be very nice and like have a lot of thought be put into them. Um, but yeah, we're just trying to bring a, a very fun angle and a very, or in some ways, funny angle to chess. We're super focused on the bird. I'm doing a quest to 3000 right now with the bird opening. What do you, what would you assume my, my win rate is with the bird, by the way? So again, like you're I'm asking the question, excuse my, <laughs> excuse yeah. my answer. So uh, I'm going to say, the, given that bias, I'm going to say 60%. In my last quest to 3000, it was 90%. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievably useful. It's wow. unbelievably good. Uh, and I'm playing, keep in mind, I'm playing against like 28, 27s and 2600s on chess. Wow. Com. That's, yeah. that's impressive. The idea though, is that it's just such an unorthodox structure. It doesn't matter that they're so well versed in all these more thematic, more orthodox positions like king pawn, queen pawn. When they get f4, the only way that they would really know it is either if they played bird opening themselves or if they play the classical Dutch, and then they would know a lot of the ideas. Right. But well, I hate playing against the Dutch. So, you know, <laughs> to me, it makes perfect sense. You know, like the computer yeah. can tell me I'm plus one all at once. I, I just feel like I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. You know. <laughs> so yeah. Um. All right. Well, Raven, this has been fantastic. So I'll link to your chessable course. Listeners should definitely check for your forthcoming bird course. Link to your YouTube channel. Are Are you taking students right now? Uh, I'm taking a few. I have like three slots available. Okay. So yeah. we will I'm link to, to your... It... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, I was going to say, I'm just trying to keep it condensed because I'm focusing on the YouTube and making other course material. Yeah. Stuff. Makes sense. Um, excellent. Anything else before we, we let you go? Any parting thoughts? Uh, no, thanks for having me. This was, this was really fun. I think I can't, I, I don't think there was like a single dead moment. Yeah. I mean, you caught me a couple of times, like uh, not having done chapter seven, you know, <laughs> having read the Agard book. Yeah, you got so. to do, do chapter seven. <laughs> yeah. So, so embarrassing for me, but yeah, I had a lot of fun as well. Um, all right. So, uh, so thank, thank you, Raven. And, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll link to your stuff and yeah, hopefully we can chat again sometime. Uh, good luck getting uh, acclimated in Paraguay. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was fun. Okay. Take care.